Vetfolio voice listeners, welcome to this podcast episode jointly sponsored by Hills and Chewy. In this episode, we'll be talking all about client communication. My guest today is Dr. Lindsay Bullen, who's a board-certified veterinary nutritionist. So she'll be talking about client communications specifically in the context of nutrition, but the concepts she presents can be applied to any conversation. And as we all know, client communication has become more important than ever, but also more challenging than ever. So who better to give this talk than Dr. Bullen? Guys, I don't think she stumbled over a single word in this entire recording. Not only are her messages on target, she's just a fabulous communicator in and of herself. So now that I have you on the edge of your seat, here's a little more about Dr. Bullen. Dr. Bullen earned dual bachelor's degrees in chemistry and zoology at North Carolina State University. She then went on to earn her DVM from North Carolina State in 2012, followed by an internship, nutrition residency, and fellowship. After earning her board certification in veterinary nutrition, Dr. Bullen created the Clinical Nutrition Service at the Veterinary Specialty Hospital of the Carolinas and has been working there ever since. Dr. Bullen is particularly interested in clinical nutrition application, specifically critical care, multi-disease state, and assisted feeding. Though she's no longer in academia, Dr. Bullen brings experience and a strong passion for teaching. And that passion really comes through in her talk. Let's get into it and you'll see what I mean. All right, we are here today with Dr. Lindsay Bullen. Uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, we are thrilled to have you. So you are a board certified veterinary nutritionist. Can you tell us a little bit just about your background, your interest in nutrition? Absolutely. I'd be delighted to. So before I went to vet school, I had no idea that specialties even existed. I thought that we would go be vets and basically do everything as our general practitioners do. They are specialists in almost everything. However, when I got there, I realized that I could be a zoo vet. I could be a surgeon. I I could literally do whatever I wanted. And at that point, I decided I'm going to be a surgeon because that is cool. My dad is a human surgeon. I love operating. I I love suturing, all of these wonderful things. And then I realized that most of the surgeons at my vet school, wonderful individuals, were mostly male. And um, at the time, I I thought all of them were wonderful to work with, but I, I didn't really find that, you know, female surgery mentor, somebody that could really demonstrate what it was like to be a working mother and a you know professional and a successful professional at that and that doesn't mean they don't exist but the one that I really kind of latched onto that happened to be there at the time ended up going to another location you know for her career which was wonderful but I was like you know maybe maybe I don't necessarily need this or want this because being a a successful professional and a mother was really important to me so I went back and said okay I'm going to be a general practitioner because, again, they specialize in everything. I can dabble in everything. This is a wonderful opportunity to really help the general population, and that is really exciting. And then I took a basic nutrition course, which is unfortunately very dry. There, there's nothing about basic nutrition <laughs> that you can make really, really exciting about proteins, this, that, and the other. But I found my first real kind of mentor at vet school. And when I started working with this individual one-on-one, I really saw the passion that goes into that field. And then when we started to do real clinical applications, so once you get over, this is an amino acid, this is a fatty acid, and all the really important information you have to have that's really dry, I determined that nutrition is a puzzle. Every case you're going to address differently, whether they have the same problem or not. Every patient is an individual. I'm also really dorky. I love math. So every single case, I get to do lots and lots of math to determine exactly where I want my nutrients to be and how I'm going to develop my assisted feeding formulas. And then the biggest draw for me for nutrition was communication, which is really exciting because that's what we're going to talk about today. I love to teach. You might not have guessed this, maybe you did, but I love to talk (laughs) and and I love communicating. And so the opportunity to do math, to work a puzzle with every single patient and to communicate effectively to not only my colleagues, but also my clients and the opportunity to teach, 
I had found my calling. And so my background encompassed a four-year veterinary degree at NC State. I stayed on for a rotating medical, surgical, and nutrition internship. I was very lucky. It was specialized. And then I diverged for a year, went to live in Switzerland with my husband because that was really fun. And he lived abroad and I missed him. And then I came home (laughs) and uh, ended up doing a nutrition residency also at NC State, which was two years. And then I stayed on for a nutrition postdoc because I had my first son during my residency, which was challenging. (laughs) So I needed to finish some things up. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, good for you. Um, you know, I'm also a working mother and I agree with you. Something that's that was very important to me as well. So good for you for finding your niche, something you love, something you're really passionate about and, and getting to really do all these things that are so important. Well, thank you so much. And, and congratulations to you as well. My hope is that people like you and me, we can be mentors for other, other professionals that want to be working parents, not just moms, but working parents. So, right, right. Exactly. And, and really hopefully be the example of you can have it all, you know, it's not always going to be perfect, but you can have it all. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I love it. In this era we live in, things have kind of gotten turned on their heads and uh, many practices we're busier than we've ever been, but also a lot of practices are still implementing curbside practices, which is making it harder and harder to, or just changing the way that we communicate with our clients. How have you seen client communication be affected by all of this? That's a really good question. So just to kind of bring it back again for nutrition, I would say 99% of what I do is communication. And then the other 1% is developing, you know, a nutrition plan. (laughs) And so, you know, for my team, this is something that we have to practice, not just, you know, daily or not just per appointment, but literally every single minute. And so, you know, for, for some, for a team that really truly specializes in communication, there are things that I would not have foreseen. So we tend to feel like we over-communicate. We have templates for everything. We have, you know, spreadsheets that document when we contact clients and this, that, and the other to make sure, or at least to try to reduce the risk that clients fall through the cracks. And still clients, you know, will communicate with us. They perceive that we're not communicating effectively. And really when we delve deep into that, what I found in general is just people's resilience is starting to fail. You know, and and I feel that as a a professional mom, you know, my resilience is failing. Don't, (laughs) please don't tell anybody. My my temper is a lot shorter (laughs) than, you know, than it normally is. Me too, I'm with (laughs) you. I mean, it's hard. And so that's something that I have to remember. It's not just me, but it's our clients too. And most of these clients, you know, they're here because their pet is sick or there's a concern. So not only do we have a pandemic and then social isolation when we are, you know, basically a a herd, people are herd, you know, animals. Now we also have the pet is sick and the client can't be with their pet. There is, you know, no doubt in my mind that this is why, you know, there has been concern with communication. The other thing too is that in addition to kind of just people's resilience failing, um, is that not everybody has communication training or is comfortable with communication, right? So when I went to vet school, we had a couple electives of communication. And then I think we had maybe one kind of like end semester course of communication. And that is it. I have been informed now that there's, you know, communication classes and and, and things that are incorporated into the curriculum. I'm sure somebody will look back and be like, that's not true. You had a class and you forgot. (laughs) But my recollection was that we did not have as much communication as a veterinary professional truly needs. And the only reason why I I think that I am as comfortable as I am is just because this is something I really like to do. And I've challenged myself to grow as a communicator, but that isn't the case for everybody. And so you take a bunch of brilliant, potentially introverts, and then cut them off from the world. And now we're asking them to communicate effectively. And we don't have those nonverbals to pull from anymore. I mean, a lot of the communication that we get, not just from, you know, pets, but like also from our clients is nonverbal. It's not the words that they use. And so if we're doing everything over the phone or, you know, without a, a Zoom or a Teams type meeting, we are missing out on a lot of aspects of communication. And it can be really, really challenging to get those nuances. And that leads to miscommunication in abundance, whether you say all the words or not, because again, with our clients, 
you know, having less resilience and with our clinicians and our staff having less resilience, we might say something, you know, like legitimately say something with words and the client might not get it because they're focused on the last thing you said and we can't see their face to know that they're still stuck in the past or that they're confused or that there's questions. So we just say, do you understand? They say yes, and then we move on. So it's so important to me that we develop that relationship and that it be long lasting so that they are comfortable with what I'm recommending. And also so they feel comfortable telling me when it doesn't work. That's something that I learned early on in my career is I had a couple clients where the consultation just, it didn't work for their particular pet and they were embarrassed to contact me. They didn't wanna hurt my feelings. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, like, this is my job to help you, (laughs) you know? So, so now I tell every client on the phone that I am here to help. I want them to tell me if things are working. I want them to tell me even more if things are not working. And then we're going to work together to try to find a plan for them and their pet. But if they don't, if they can't contact me, if they don't feel comfortable, contact me, how can I help them? And again, I can type that, but a lot is lost with written word. And so at least being able to talk with them over the phone so they can hopefully hear, you know, my passion and hear my empathy, that's helpful. But if they can see it, if they can see that, you know, I'm smiling and and see that, you know, I I frown appropriately and, and, and that I, you know, that I really truly feel what they're feeling, that really helps to build that bond between the veterinarian and the client. So ultimately I can help their pet better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially with nutrition. There's so many voices out there and they are not all scientifically driven or veterinarians. So to be able to give people a source of information that is trustworthy and like you said, being there to help along the way with their pet, I think is invaluable. Thank you. Yeah. So it can be really easy for nutrition to fall by the wayside and there's so much else going on and we may, you know, not touch on that. Can you give us a reminder just why it's so important for us to touch on nutrition in the exam room and make sure we're bringing this up every time? Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking that question. So one of the things that I like to describe is that if you have a gas powered car, it cannot go without fuel and your body is no different. If you do not have nutrients or nutrition, your body can't go. Now, if you put diesel in a gas car, it might go really poorly, or you might break the engine and it won't go at all. It, and it's this, the second one. My husband is the second that. one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't tell done him that. I told you that. <laughs> I won't tell. <laughs> but, but exactly, you know, exactly what I mean. If you put the wrong type of fuel, the wrong type of nutrients, the wrong concentration of nutrients into a body, it will not go well, or it might not go at all. And so most people understand, you know, you have to eat to live but really we have to eat well to live. And so whether, you know, it's a puppy or a kitten the first time, we need to make sure that they are getting the appropriate nutrients in terms of type and in concentration to not only just kind of meet their basic needs, but to help them to thrive. And the same is said for maintenance. You know, their needs are gonna be very different from a puppy or a kitten. Once we become geriatric, those needs are different. And unfortunately, as we age, we're going to develop, you know, different disease states and every single disease state has a set nutrient profile and combination, you know, of proportion of nutrients that that patient needs to optimize not just their normal metabolic processes, but really to augment medical and surgical therapies. And that's kind of the biggest takeaway here for me. Very rarely as a nutritionist, do I save the day? You know, I, I have my cape ready. I'm ready to bust in that door <laughs> and say super nutritionist, you know, to the rescue. But really, we are here as an ancillary service to make sure that our colleagues' medical therapies are optimized and their surgical therapies are optimized so that we can ultimately collaborate and work together for the best possible clinical outcome. And there are so many studies across multiple species, human, dog, cat, you name it, you got it that demonstrate without nutrition or with inappropriate nutrition, morbidity and mortality are increased, length of stay in the hospital has increased, delayed wound healing. I mean, pick pick a, a bad outcome and poor nutrition will contribute to that. And optimal nutrition will help reduce the risk of developing those things. So really, really important. The other reason why it is so incredibly important to bring it into the exam room every single time is to get your client used to it and to get practice for ourselves. You know, I, I wasn't always as knowledgeable as I am now, and don't get me wrong, there's plenty of room for growth for me professionally. 
but one of the reasons why I, I find that I, I hope I continue to grow is because I try to practice things that I'm, I'm not good at or I'm not comfortable at. And that's really how we grow as professionals and what I try to encourage my interns, my residents, and, and my nurses and, and my colleagues to do. If there's something you're not comfortable with, make yourself comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, challenge yourself to, to try because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for us. And our clients, we're doing them a disservice by not bringing this up. And if we can get those clients used to it every single time, even if it's just a, what are you feeding? That's a great option. Keep up the great work. When the time comes when we need to really make a firm nutrition recommendation, they're more likely to listen to us because they know it's part of the norm. And hopefully at that point, we have developed a really positive and long lasting relationship with that client. So they trust our medical opinion and they don't think we're just making something up, <laughs> you know? Hopefully when we make that, that recommendation, they say, you know what? They bring up nutrition every single time. They've never steered me wrong. This must be really, really important. And, you know, again, we as, as clinicians, it's okay to not know the answer. There's plenty of things I don't know the answer to. And we can tell our, our clients, this is what I think. I don't know the exact answer to the question, but I'm going to steer you in the right direction, or I'm going to look it up for you. So as long as there's, you know, a, a method to continue communicating to that client, I, I think that, you know, we really, really can be helping the, the whole veterinary world in that case. I love your passion for this because you're right. Nutrition in and of itself is so important. And I think you really hit the nail on the head with something that we all need to continue to remember and to remind ourselves of and to remind each other about being comfortable, being uncomfortable, that it's not always going to be easy to go in and have a certain conversation, but that doesn't mean that we can avoid it. You know, it's still important to, to continue to do these things so that we can grow as professionals. Yeah, absolutely. And especially during a pandemic, we're getting very comfortable being uncomfortable. It's made communication in general incredibly challenging, but even more important to have some of these conversations and to develop our communication skills since we don't really get to have that face-to-face -face interaction with our clients anymore or our colleagues for that matter. Here you and I are talking <laughs> across oh, the United States. So. <laughs> I know. And I'm so thankful that, you know, we are, we're in an age where we have the ability to do this kind of stuff, but man, I can't wait for more face-to-face -face conversations and interactions, hopefully at some point. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're on the topic of being comfortable, being uncomfortable, um, having tough conversations, whether they're tough for us or for owners or both. Pet obesity is one of these that we sometimes often, we have to have this conversation, but it's not always the easiest conversation to have. Can you talk a little bit about why this is such a tough conversation and maybe some pointers that you have to make it a little bit easier? Absolutely. So I'm really glad you brought that up. We're still technically on October, even though this is likely to air in November, but October is Pet Obesity Awareness Month. So I'm really, really glad we're touching on that. The truth is pet obesity is another epidemic. Um, the majority of patients that come into our hospital are overweight to obese, which is really sad because that means the minority are not. And really it should be the opposite, right? And so it can be an incredibly, incredibly challenging thing to discuss. Part of that I think is due to um, society. So think about all of the really cute memes and pictures of overweight or obese pets that are doing cute things like eating ice cream or, or licking hot dogs or whatever it might be. And we as a society, A, you know, tack on that this is a, a cute thing. And don't get me wrong, like visually, it can be kind of cute depending <laughs> on what that overweight animal is doing. <laughs> but it also brings some normalcy to it. And because there is an obesity epidemic, not only our clients, but our colleagues are just like, oh, well, this is the new norm. You know, the, the new normal is a body condition of seven out of nine. And just to kind of remind everybody, four to five out of nine would be considered ideal. So anything above a five is overweight to obese. And at one point, like long ago, the scale only went up to nine, which is an estimated 40% body fat. We have since had to add plus, 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 plus. I mean, it, the scale just continues to grow because we now have patients that have 60, 65, and 70% body fat, which is insane. And again, normal is going to be 15 to 20% body fat. That's healthy. And so 
you know, this is something that we absolutely have to address. And, and part of this conversation is going to be a helping the client and our colleagues, you know, depending on their comfort level and training, first recognize what obesity really is. And it's not just weight. So weight, it's really important to keep in mind is a combination of all tissue types. So it's going to be your lean muscle mass, your bone mineral content, your adipose, all of those things combined. And so when we see weight trends, you know, either going up or going down, most people assume that it's body fat, but it isn't necessarily the case which is why body condition scoring is so important and so important for colleagues, um, for our colleagues and clinicians to practice and so important for us to try to educate and teach our, our clients on. And so body condition scoring really assesses just the adipose and it's not just visual, you have to get your hands on the animal because if it's a fluffy cat or a cute little Pomeranian, there's no way to know what lies underneath that fur. And so I think part of it is gonna be training Again, depending on, on what vet school people go to, if there's a nutritionist there, a nutrition service, that's going to be part of it. The other part is that it is just really uncomfortable telling a client that their pet is fat. And so there are ways, and I'm not saying that my ways are necessarily the best, but I have found ways that seem to work for me and my team where we can genuinely and you know, carefully, but also caringly educate our clients on, on what is happening. And for me, what I try to always do, no matter what the case is, obesity or not, is make my exam room, whether it's virtual or in person, be one without judgment. And so, you know, it, it's, it's hard for us sometimes as veterinarians and veterinary professionals and, and just people, I mean, humans are, are can be judgy <laughs> and I'm I definitely have my times of judgment. It's hard to keep that out of our voices or out of our faces. And so when we see a pet that's overweight or obese, it is so important to communicate with the client what they are doing right. So the happy sandwich. First of all, you brought your pet to us. It demonstrates that you care. It demonstrates that your pet's health is paramount to you. You're feeding them a high quality food. Look what a good job you're doing. You take them for five walks a day during the pandemic. You must care so much. So it's really, really important to recognize all of the good things that the client is doing for their pet. And then we can kind of sandwich it and say one of the things we want to talk about is your, your pet's weight and specifically, you know, their fat content. They are considered overweight. And then immediately, once you give that piece of information, let them know that's not your fault. Sometimes animals, their metabolism slows as they age, you know, and, and that is a very normal process or they, it slows after being spayed or neutered, or, you know, sometimes, you know, things just happen or, you know, man, this pandemic, <laughs> everybody's doing the COVID-15, you know, whatever it is. And, and you have to kind of play your client, right? You have to know what type of client it is. It, do jokes help? Do they need to be serious? Do they need to be comforted? All of these things are really important to keep in mind because one technique isn't going to work for everybody. But for me, I tell them every time, this is not necessarily your fault. Sometimes it just happens, but I am here to help and we're going to work together as a team. This is a team approach and you client are the expert in your pet and you always know best for your pet. I am the expert in nutrition and I am going to help guide this weight loss journey and we're going to do it together. And that's really how I approach it is collaboration, you know, teamwork. It's a journey. I'm always here to help. And it's not your fault. And when that combination ensues, we tend to have pretty good conversation with the client and, and pretty good receptivity. I think it's also really challenging because sometimes there might be an overweight to obese pet in combination with an overweight or obese client. And, you know, our colleagues are potentially uncomfortable bringing it up because they're concerned that it could come across the wrong way. And I know personally, I've had cases where I've brought up a pet's weight and the client says, well, I'm overweight too. And that's really hard. Like, what do you say to that? Right. And right, so, yeah. and so <laughs> I'm like, oh no. And that first time that happened, I was an intern and I was like, uh, but you know, <laughs> you, crickets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Usually what I say, you know, is I, I'm like, you know what? Me, I was like, me too. <laughs> you know? So, so again, it, it depends on your relationship with that client, if it's somebody I've worked with before, or, you know, we've got off on the right foot, I'll be like, aren't we all, you know, <laughs> like, like I'm working with a dietitian, and that's, that's actually real. I do work with a dietitian, a human one. And so just say, Hey, you know what? There's no, ju no judgment, no blame. I work with a dietitian, but we're going to focus on fluffy today. Or, you know, depending on your comfort level, sometimes you can say, 
you know, something to the effect of, well, I am definitely not a human doctor, but we're, you know, we're going to, we're going to go back to fluffy. So again, it really depends on that comfort level, but that's usually, usually what I do is there's no judgment. We're in hard times and I see a dietitian too. So let's get back to fluffy. But, you know, it's hard. It's really, really hard to bring up these challenging conversations, especially when there's a stigma in the human side of things and a stigma on the pet side of things. But it really breaks down to education for me. So when I have clients that kind of push back a little bit, they're like, well, he's not that overweight or what's the big deal? Then I'll bring up, you know, the Keeley study. So this is one of kind of the major studies that demonstrates that animals that are of an ideal condition um, live onwards of three plus years longer than their overweight counterparts, which is insane. And so, you know, that might not be statistically significant, but for a client and a pet parent, that is clinically significant. And for veterinary professionals, that is, you know, financially and clinically significant. I mean, if I think about my, you know, current pets, I had a German shepherd who unfortunately passed away at the age of eight, you know, due to cancer, not obesity, but I would have done almost anything to have just another couple of years with him. And most clients would feel the same way. And so when I tell them, you know, not only will obesity shorten their life, but it, it diminishes the quality of life that they have with you. A lot of times, you know, my clients are willing to jump on this weight loss bandwagon. And again, work together as a team, you know, for the common goal, for the benefit of their pet. I like it. I like it. That's an approach that I like too, is particularly what you said about you are the expert in your pet. I like to approach clients that way too and say, you know, you tell me what's going on at home. What are you seeing with them? You know them better than anybody else. And then combining that with, you know, addressing all the positives and science and this study you know, I'm thinking right now, I have a 14-year-old dog at home, which seems like, okay, you know, she's lived this wonderful life, but my gosh, I'm if she could live three more years, like, I don't feel like 14 is enough. I don't think we ever feel like, you know, we have enough with our pet. You mentioned your German Shepherd that you lost at eight. I lost my Roddy at 11 and it's, you know, it's just never enough. Doesn't, doesn't seem like a long time. So even if it's not statistically significant, I think it's a it's a major factor in communicating with people. Absolutely. And, you know, depending on, on how much information the client wants. And again, this is another kind of aspect of communication. If we just blast facts at our clients, sometimes they can get overwhelmed and don't get me wrong. I get overwhelmed too when people blast facts in my face, but sometimes, you know, certain clients will need an additional push. And oftentimes what I'll do is say, Hey, there's a plethora of disease states that, have an increased risk of development if you are overweight to obese. And each one of those can have huge financial impacts on, you know, the client. So for example, diabetes, that is going to be a a huge impact if they have to do insulin, you know, for the rest of their pet's life. And then all of the potential risks for, you know, diabetic crises. I mean, that's for me personally, not a risk I'm willing to take. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. It's it's not worth it, you know, when it hopefully is something that you can work together on to address weight and mitigate a lot of these other risk factors. Do you think there's some positives that have come out of this whole situation? I mean, increased owner compliance because people are home with their pets or maybe being able to do telemedicine or video conferencing is more convenient where they're not having to drive to a clinic. Have you seen some positives come out of this? Yeah, actually I really have. So I'll be honest, when the pandemic first hit, I was a little concerned that I was going to potentially lose my job (laughs) because some people consider nutrition to be, you know, a luxury commodity. And obviously we know my opinion on that. Everybody needs appropriate nutrition, (laughs) but, you know, I was really worried that the people that were, you know, paying money to tailor their pet's nutrition would dwindle and go away. What I found is that, as you said, more people were home with their pets and they were recognizing problems that they might not have recognized otherwise. So these animals are getting earlier care for problems that might've gone unnoticed for, you know, another couple of months or potentially years. So that is a positive that these pets are getting, you know, more help. The other positive, at least for me and my team, is that we've been able to reach more people because they now can invest time in their pet's nutrition. And that's something that I honestly didn't see coming. We have people that are at home and they're like, well, 
I'm bored. My pet's bored. What can I do for them? I'm going to take an active role and that's cooking, you know, so I've got more homemade diets than I know what to do with. On the other hand, you know, especially when the pandemic first hit and everybody was mass buying <laughs> ingredients or pet food, I was busier than ever because, you know, diets that I recommended were out of stock. And so now we have to find alternative diets. So the, some of the good things, you know, increased pets coming to the hospital for problems, increased, you know, work for my team, which means that we can reach and help more clients and more pets. And really, this has been a wonderful educational opportunity for my team. I've got some new nurses and they're wonderful. They're so passionate, but it's excellent for them to learn because we have such a good caseload. And again, it's a really, really good opportunity to practice and hone our communication skills and to really try to help each other. One of the, the biggest things that I've tried to, to practice when I preach it is to take care of ourselves. So I cannot help my family, I cannot help my patients, and I cannot help my clients and colleagues if I don't take care of myself. And so the pandemic has given some people opportunities to focus more on their care. So in turn, they can focus on their pets and their family's care as well. And, and that's something that I really try to, to emphasize, especially when everybody is so stressed out and has such pressure on their plates right now, is to try to take some time for yourself. Right. And sometimes pets are, you know, they give you that, that outlet, that thing to focus on where you can maybe tune out the rest of what's going on in the world right now and say, you know, this is a positive thing in my life that I can focus on and, and I say focus on, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, you know, your pet is this thing, you know, your companion and, and like you said, really take an active role in their well-being and their life. And of course, like you said, nutrition is the cornerstone of all of that. Absolutely. And I think you said it perfectly. This is, even though it's a terrible situation, it's a good opportunity to take care of everybody together. So I've noticed I take more walks with my dog. Because, you know, before when I would go into the office for eight to 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, come home really fast, let her out, come home really fast. And then you've got the kids and everybody's juggling dinner. And suddenly it's the end of the day and you're like, oh, here's the ball one time, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I feel horribly guilty. But now when I work from home, she's in my face and I'm like, oh, you know what? I haven't let you out. Let's go for a 10 minute walk. So it's good for me because I get away from my screen for 10 minutes. I can take a deep breath and reset, you know, either whether it's good stress or bad stress or whatever, I get that, you know, 10 minute refresher break and she gets more activity and interaction as well. And so really we're benefiting together, you know, by, by being together. And like I said, there's so many stressful and unfortunate and horrible things happening, sometimes it is nice to find the good in a situation. And being able to spend a little bit more time with our loved ones, pets, kids, whatever, is definitely something that I at least have been able to, to notice a, a positive here. And I hope others are noticing that too. Absolutely. It's been such a wild and crazy year. Got to focus on the positives where we can find them. And with all the negative, there really have been some good positives that have come out of all of this. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. This has been fantastic. We really appreciate all of your insight. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our listeners before we go? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I really want to thank you all for having me. This is, again, an honor and a privilege to be here. Communication and education is a passion. So being able to reach so many people is really something that I am grateful for the opportunity to do. A last little tidbit is something I would just say, be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. You know, this is a really, really hard time, especially this time of year. <laughs> and just, just remember in general, we are all people, everybody has their own struggles. And so start each morning with, you know, words of kindness for yourself so that you can be the best clinician you can be. You can be the best, you know, partner, spouse, whatever parent you can be. And you can be the best communicator to your clients. And then remember that our clients, we have a really hard profession in general. And some of them are wonderful and great, but we tend to remember the bad, even when they're few and far between. Try to remember that they are not the norm. Try to remember that they have their own challenges and they're scared and they're actually there for your professional advice and they're there because they trust you. And if we can kind of get past that and just, you know, really focus on that we're all here together, clients, colleagues, staff, whatever, to help the pet, then really I, I think we can go far. And all of that is going to boil down to being positive and communication. 
and being open to feedback. You know, if a client says that there's an issue, you might have done everything correctly, but it's really good to learn that maybe this, you know, technique doesn't work for everybody, or maybe this particular client needs a little TLC or, or whatever it might be. And that doesn't mean that we fail as professionals, doesn't mean we fail as people, but we have to work together for the benefit of the pet. And honestly, not to be, you know, super, super silly, but for the world, really, I mean, we're in this together. So just remember, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. I love it. I love it. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It truly has been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Bolin, for that great talk. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And thank you to Hills and Chewy for sponsoring this event. If you'd like to find out more about this and other exciting podcasts, click on the education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this session, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.